Amen. This morning, I want to read from 1 Samuel 11. I want to continue that thought, the sign of the sun, because God is emphasizing something in this house, and I want us to pay attention. Because every time that God wants to do a thing, what he does is to send a word. Hallelujah. The Bible says he sent forth his word, and the word that he sent healed and delivered. So when God sends a word, it's indicative of what he wants to do. Hallelujah. In 1 Samuel 11, I'll read from verse 1. Please pay attention. Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped around Jabez Gilead. And all the men of Jabez said to Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve you. And Nahash the Amorite answered them, On this condition, I will make a covenant with you, that I may put out all your right eyes and bring reproach on all Israel. Then the elders of Jabesh said to him, Hold off for seven days, that we may send messengers to the territory of Israel. And then if there is no one to save us, we will come out to you. So the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and told the news in the hearing of the people. And all the people lifted up their voice, voices and wept. Now there was Saul coming behind the herd from the field. And Saul said, what troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this news, and his anger was greatly aroused. So he took a yoke of oxen, cut them in pieces, sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it will be done to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people. And they came out with one consent. When he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah, 30,000. And they said to the messengers who came, First you shall say to the men of Jabez Gilead, Tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, you will have help. I want you to say to your neighbor, you will have help. He said, tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, you will have help. Now, I read that long passage so that you can see the predicament that these people found themselves. They found themselves in a place where it was like they were between the deep blue sea and the devil. They came and they said, let's make treaty with you. They even submitted themselves to serve. But the guy said, no. I'm not interested in this deal that you are bringing. What I want to do is that I want to pluck out your eyes, your right eyes. And when they saw that that was, that was a work negotiation, they said, just give us a minute. Let's look around and see if we can find help. If we don't have anybody to rescue us, then we won't have a choice but to submit to your demand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Bible said when they went round, there was Saul. And Saul sent this message to them. He said, tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, you will have help. Hallelujah. And that's so prophetic and so profound. You know, we found ourselves as a people, as a nation, in a place where if you listen to the news every day, it just spells doom and hopelessness. If you listen to what people are saying, if you listen to the state of insecurity, you just begin to wonder, is there hope? Can there be help? You know, I, I, I had some news yesterday of how insurgent overpowered, you know, um, the security forces and kidnapped, you know, children. You know, things are just happening. And then, you know, the hearts of many are failing. The hearts of many are failing. You know, we can say we live in a region where these things are not happening yet. You know what Mordecai said to um, Esther? 
He said, don't think that because you are in this place, in this place of comfort, that if you don't speak now, that God is not able to raise help from somewhere else. But don't even think that because you are in the palace, that you will escape what is coming. Because you don't know if you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Hallelujah. I came to declare to us this morning that there is help for Nigeria. That's the word that, you know, came to my heart. And you see, as we say that, because you see, the help is not going to come from anywhere else. But you see, God has stationed us as the people. You know, when the word came, um, during our second anniversary, the word came that we should enlarge, right? And at the same time, we're hearing a conflicting news that we just entered into recession. So it's like, this is confusing. What are we supposed to do? Follow the recession or enlarge? Every time that the word of God comes, every time that the prophetic word comes, the situation on ground is not favorable to the word. It's as though when God is speaking, God is not aware that there's recession. But he's saying to you to enlarge. Now, I want us to backtrack a bit so that we can see, you know, into the life of the one that is speaking. You just need to go back a few chapters. When Saul was declaring this, nobody knew what had gone on behind the scene. If you go to a few chapters before here, you will find that in, in the house of Saul, as it were, there was a great problem. And I call it a great problem because of the attitude of Saul's father. The Bible recorded that their asses had gone missing. And the father said, you know what? You need to go and look for those asses. So he left with a servant. It's because of time. When you get home, you can read it. So he left with a servant. You know, when I read that passage of scriptures, what it says to my mind was that those asses were so important to the father that the father would rather have his son go missing than the asses. Because you will find that, you know, as we read, that it got to a point that after Saul met with Samuel, he said, now your father has ceased worrying for the asses because they've been found. Now he's worried for you. So, which means if those asses were not found, the man would not remember that his son was missing. That's to tell you that, you know, the source of their livelihood was challenged. It was some kind of a meltdown for their family. But you see, when that happened, it was God orchestrating something behind the scene. God needed to move Saul to a location where he will come face to face with destiny. Because when he went up to meet Samuel, by the advice of, you know, the servant that went with him, what he went for was to inquire because they didn't know where to go. They didn't know how to trace the asses. You know, they didn't have any kind of compass. So the servant said to him that there is a prophet. If you go to that prophet, I'm sure that that prophet can point us to the direction where we need to go. But before they would approach where the prophet was, there was a preparation going on. Whilst the preparation was going on, Saul had no clue what was going on behind the scene. For him, he was beclouded by the challenge of the missing asses. He knew the state that he left the house. And he must have been so worried that, look, if we don't get this, I don't know what is going to happen in at home. Hallelujah. And so, they were heading off to look for these missing asses. And as they got to the place, please pay attention. As they got to the place, you can imagine how it is. I want you to picture yourself, you know, in Saul's position. And somebody said to him that there is this mighty man of God. It's a prophet of God. That if you go to him, you look, whatever it is that troubles you, you will not leave without finding solution. And then as they approached the place, they found out that that man of God was so busy that there was an important occasion that was about to happen and he was preparing for that occasion. If you were Saul, or I bet if I was the one, I would say to myself that let me not disturb this man because I don't want embarrassment. You know, let me, let me, let me try to bring it to a scenario that we can understand. Say somebody sent you to maybe a Bishop Oedipo, for instance, 
And then you say, oh, I just need to see him for maybe two minutes so that he can just pray and just speak a word of, you know, and just tell me what I need to do and all that. And then you get to where he was, and then you discover that he was preparing for Shiloh. Say, the man is so busy right now, Shiloh is about to happen. What, what, what's going to, what are you going to say to yourself? Say, maybe I should come back another time because the way this thing is going, this man is so busy, he won't have time for this, my little problem, Right? But guess what? All those preparation was about Saul. Even the prophet that was preparing didn't know the person for which the preparation was being made. He was just getting ready. And all of a sudden, when he appeared, God spoke to Samuel in his ears and said, the man I spoke to you about, that is him. Hear me, people of God. Why will God do that? Why will God move in such a way in that particular season that he would... Because if those asses were not missing, I don't think that Saul will ever think of meeting Samuel. I don't think that he will ever leave the comfort of his home or to begin to, you know, bother himself whether there was a prophet called Samuel or Moses or whatever. No. But something moved him to go and inquire but it was a setup by God. It was a setup. God had a bigger plan in mind for him. Now, I don't know who I'm speaking to this morning, but I know that somebody here under the sound of my voice, maybe you are watching at home now through YouTube or something. Something moved you to this service. There's something that is in your heart. And you are, you are, you are praying and trusting that the word will come for me. Oh, that, that those things that I have lost... That God will just remember and put his word in the mouth of this prophet so that he can address that issue. I have news for you. You are here for a bigger purpose. It is more than those missing as it's a setup by God so that he can come face to face with destiny. And you see, when he got there, someone said to him, Come, come. There is a bigger purpose for you here in God. It's beyond what is missing. And guess what? He also told him, he said, what made you to live where you are? That thing that is troubling you, as a sign that this is a setup by God, they have been found. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm saying that to somebody this morning prophetically. I don't know what it is that you are looking for. I don't know what it is that has made you to seek the face of God for this long. I don't know what it is that has made you to cry. I don't know what it is that has made you to, you know, go from pillar to post, from meetings to meetings. I came to tell you this morning that that thing has been found. Yeah. But it's, it was for a bigger purpose. It was after that time that Saul was anointed king over God's people. Now, that thing happened, and it was not known to everybody. But you see, God at this time had prepared. You see, when people call him the God of special effect, it's actually true. Because when he then anoints a king, and many people are watching and say, who is this Saul? Who is he? What credentials does he have? How can he be king? And then God set up a bit of drama. And what was the drama? Some people were being bothered. Some people were being troubled. Some people were pushed to the world. They were pushed to the point where they were looking for help. They were looking for solution. And they say, you know what? Give us seven days. If we don't find anybody to help us, we will come and submit to your demand. But God had moved behind the scene to raise a man. You see, before the question, God has prepared the answer. The challenge with a lot of people is that we are so much involved in the question that we fail to see the answer. The answer is right there. Before they knew, before Nahash came here, God had anointed Saul. So you see, many times, I wonder the way people see God. You know, the way we treat God is as though, you know, the devil is ahead of God and it's God is playing catch up. When I see people talking about the Antichrist, you know, the Antichrist, the Antichrist. And I'm like, hey, hello. The only reason why there's an Antichrist is because there's a Christ. 
And every activity of the Antichrist is in opposition of the Christ. So when people are talking of the mark of the beast, ever before the mark of the beast, there's the mark of Christ. And that's why Paul was saying, I bear in my body the mark of Christ. If you bear the mark of Christ, you have no business being afraid of the mark of the beast. God is not playing catch up with the devil. In fact, what I think and what I believe is that the devil is on a perpetual role of deception. He's actually working for God. <laughs> because, you see, every time he moves against the plan and the purpose of God, he actually hastens it to perfection. Because God had raised a man. God had anointed a man. And Nahash only gave him a platform to show that he's the one that God had anointed. Because it was this that made the people of Israel to say, after Saul had gone to this battle, you know, and delivered the men of Jabez Gilead, they now say, where are those people that say that Saul will not rule over us? Hear me. I came to tell you this morning that whilst you are being disturbed by your challenges, whilst you are being buried, you know, you have buried your head in the things that troubled you, God is orchestrating for you a situation that is going to announce the gifting of God on your inside. It's an orchestration of God that will bring about the gifting of God. You know, the Bible says that the earnest expectation of creation is waiting for what? The manifestations of the sons of God. But the sons of God cannot manifest if there is no platform for manifestation. And the platform for manifestation is what we see in our nation today. That's a platform. If Pharaoh never had a dream, there will never have been a platform for Joseph to interpret the dream. When Joseph was interpreting the dream of Pharaoh, he did not know the interpretation of his own dream. Was it not a dream that landed him in problem? He was still in that problem, yet he was interpreting the dream of other people. Hallelujah. And so it's a, it's a divine setup by God. That we must begin to live for a purpose that is higher than self. That what you are thinking, how am I going to pay my house rent? God is saying to you that I have made you owner of estates to house people. And so when the word of God comes to say enlarge, that's what he's saying. He's saying that, you see, what is coming is so big that you need to increase your capacity. When your capacity is still about God, you know, just, just sort out my house. God is saying, no, no, you don't understand. There is something that is coming. There is something that is coming. Have you not read in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 60? It says, arise and shine. For what? Your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is what? Reason upon you. How would you know? He said, for gross darkness shall cover the people. So every time that you see darkness, every time that you see a challenge in the land, it's because light has come for you. And just like Pastor Tosin was teaching us last week, sometimes the reason why we fail to acknowledge that light is because it's just the breaking of the day. You hear what Saul said to them? He said, by the time the sun is hot... That means that by the time that they went back with that message, they were waiting for the sign of the sun. So they've told us that when the sun is hot, I came to announce to somebody that the sun is about to be hot for your sake. So you will have help. You will have help. You need to prophesy to yourself. Say, I will have help. Hallelujah. If you go to Genesis 18, Please put it on the screen. Genesis 18. You will see another example of this. Because you see, when the sun is hot, there's a posture. There's a way that we must respond. Because you see, many times when God is coming to you, he doesn't make it obvious. Genesis 18. Can we have Genesis 18 on the screen? When God is coming, the visit is for you. It's about you. Oh, this morning, this service can be just for you. But you see, many times it's not obvious. Look at what he says. Then the Lord appeared to him. 
by the turban trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. Look at this. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. Look at that. That looks like a confusion. He said they were standing by him, but he had to run to them. And if you go to the beginning, go to verse 1 again. He said the Lord appeared to him. How does the Lord appear? His appearance can be in this service. That this service is about the Lord's appearance. But you see, if you don't understand that he has appeared to you in this service and that you need to respond by running to him, you will allow him pass. And the visit was for you. This is the challenge. That many times we lose sensitivity when we ought to be sensitive. Many times we allow things that don't matter to distract us. So when the visitation of God comes, we are distracted. That's the time that suddenly your phone rings. That's the time that suddenly you want to do something. But you don't understand that the Lord appearing is not just going to, you know, many of us are waiting for him to just, he will just come with white beard. Say, behold, I am the Lord. It doesn't work that way. I'm telling you that in this message is the Lord appearing. In the songs that we've done, is the Lord's appearing. In the prayer, is the Lord. I'm not praying. I'm telling you what it is. But many people are still waiting. And that was the problem of the man by the sea. He said, I'm waiting for them to stir the water. But the visitation had come. Jesus was speaking to him. Do you desire to behold? He said, I have no man. Because many people, we are so engrossed in what we are dealing with that when God is speaking to us, we are still giving God excuse. God is saying to you that, are you ready to move to the next level? Are you ready for that to, to enlarge? Are you ready to receive that capacity to become that man, that woman that I've made you to become? You are still giving excuse. Say, God, you see, actually, the problem is, you see, if not for the answers by now, you know, and you know, God, this year is, this um, coronavirus, maybe next year. God is saying to you, are you ready to move to the next level? Because the breaking of the day, that's the sign of the sun. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible said that Jacob wrestled with the man until what? Until what? <laughs> because if you see what happened in this Genesis 18, there was, you know, the, 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 the work of Abraham, his the entirety of his work with God had been predicated on the fact that he was trusting God for a child, right? You know, he had even asked God that, what are you going to give me? Seeing that I go childless. But in Genesis 18, when God appeared, and God for the first time will tell Abraham precisely that according to the time of life, by this time next year, your wife will... That was the first time that Abraham, that time was put into the promise. Before now, it was a promise. It was a promise that he had been believing for years. But in this Genesis 18, when God appeared and was going to, you know, give him a specific time, if he was not sensitive, he would have missed that visitation. And you know what happened? The Bible said that it was in the heat of the day. You know what many people do when the sun is hot? Many people complain. Because... Sometimes when the sun is hot, it's not a comfortable time. And maybe that time your AC is not working and all. Many people complain. But you know what Abraham do? He positioned himself in such a way that he could intercept what God was doing. You see, many times we are used to complaining. Oh, this sun, what kind of useless sun is this today? Many times, you know, like we're taught last week, that day-to-day -day utterance speech that sometimes those discomfort is to position you so that you can intercept the passing of God. Sometimes it is to position you to, be, to a sensitive time of your life. Because you see, many times when we are too comfortable, when God is speaking, you cannot hear him. You can't hear him. 
Some people, when things are rosy for them, tell them, let's go to church. Say, ah, I beg, I need to rest. That's why I see some believers, I don't understand. When they're in problem, you see them, before they open church door, they're already there praying. Ooh, There's problem. <laughs> you know, they are looking for a quick fix. So I don't know about you. But you see, God's word has come in this season. And when his word comes, it's because it comes with the grace to accomplish what he has said. God has never deceived any man. You know what is called a lie? Many times you think a lie is you tell somebody I'm coming tomorrow and you don't go. That one is pre-primary school lie. What a lie is, is when you say something that you don't have the ability to do, that's a lie. And that's why God can never lie. Because the Bible says, has he said it? Will he not bring it to pass? Hallelujah. That's why we call him Aleweleshe. Aleshe Lewi. What he says he can do. In fact, we have seen, we have seen the power of God so much in so much dimensions. That one day, you know, I was praying and God said to me, God said to me, he said, what is potential? I say potential is an English word. So what does it mean? I said, well, to my mind, potential is something that you can do but have not done. And God said, that's correct. And God said to me, if you look through the scriptures, everything you read in scriptures is no longer my potential. It is my ability. There are things I've done. So just begin to look through the scriptures. Is it raising the dead to life? Is he walking on the sea? Just think about all the miracles you've seen in scriptures. All those things are God's ability. But you see, there is yet God's potential. There is yet that thing that he can do but has not done. And that thing has been reserved for you and for me. That's why the Bible said, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of any man what God has in store for who? For who? For them that love him. He said, but these things is revealed to us. By who? By his spirit. By his spirit. It is the spirit of God. And that's why when, you know, pastor said something last week about, you know, people that go to, you know, psychologists and all these things. And they tell you, you know, the reason why you and your wife is fighting because you lied and all those things. Is, you know, is because they are walking by sight. They are walking by sight. You see, the edge of the spirit, like he was saying, is that there is something that is in the heart of God. That before you came into existence, God prepared for you. Just like as Samuel met with Saul, he was in the eternal past that God had ordained that that day will happen and that Saul will be ordained king. It doesn't matter what people say, whether he missed it or didn't miss it, but you see, he was ordained by God. And it takes only a prophetic edge because there were many people standing there and God said to him, that's the man. This preparation is for this one man. I said, that shows us a dimension in God that God can put preparation together just for one man. The whole city was agog. Something was about to happen and it was just about one man. And many times that one man is not even aware I know what I'm saying. This service is about one man. And that one man, as I speak, this word will burn like fire in your heart because you know you are that one man. Because you know God can put a multi-million, billionaire meeting together just to reach one man. Because when that man comes into purpose, can you imagine if Saul had not come into that encounter, what would have happened to the men of Jabesh Gilead? What would have happened to them? They would have gone back to Nahash and submitted them to and said, remove our eyes. I'm saying this to let us understand how serious that is. That there, there's a generation of people praying they are asking God, send us a savior. 
And God has raised you for that purpose. Why you are still looking like a victim? But God has said that you are going to be the answer to the prayer of those people. Why you are still looking like somebody who has no help? God has said, I'm raising you for this purpose. That you are going to be the answer. Because I found out in scriptures that when men pray to God, God prays back to men. Hallelujah. You may not feel like it. Thank God the Bible did not say as many as are led by their feelings. You may not look like it. Because even when Saul was told, he said, who am I? Even our family in our tribe, we are the least of the tribe. You may not feel like it, you may not look like it. But you see, it is your destiny in God. And we are living in interesting times, people. That's why don't despise. You see, sometimes, again, you see, and thank God we are, we, are, we are approaching the season of Christmas. What is the biggest revelation of God? What's the biggest revelation of God? Jesus. But when Jesus was to be born, there was no room in the inn. The biggest revelation of God was born in where? A manger. Still today, people, the biggest revelation of God is still born in a manger. That's why people miss it. You know, many people had an expectation of the way Jesus should come. If he had come in that way, a lot of people would have been okay with it. But you see, God will not come in the way you want him to come. He will come in a way that he has designed to come. There was no room in the inn. When God whispered that to me, he says, still today, my biggest revelation is born in a manger. So you may look at yourself in this place and say, if God wants to bring this kind of message, I bet you will go to the cathedrals. Guys, there's always no room in the, in the manger. Because people have their own agendas and activities. But you see, if the manger would make itself available, for God's revelation to be born, then that manger will gain a kind of importance that for over 2,000 years, people will still refer to that manger. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I came to announce to somebody today that there is help for you. There is help for you. There is help for you. I know it like I know my name, that there is help. God has not left us without help. God has not left us to ourselves. If you look at the things that are happening in this nation, I want to announce to us and will be witnesses that God is about to move in this nation. You see, all those things that we're seeing, oh, we're looking at the you know, the level of the insecurity, the government, they've made us to understand that there's nothing they can do about it. I'm telling you. So now even government is negotiating with terror. But it's when that happens, it's because God has raised a man. See, and when I'm saying a man, I'm not being gender insensitive, right? Uh -huh. So you say, ah, this is a men's service. <laughs> Maybe we'll come back for women. No, 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 no. It's generic. It's generic that we have become answers. Because if we don't understand that, we are still asking, oh God, when are you going to come? And God said that you are that man. You are that woman. And he's orchestrating things behind the scene that will bring you in places where you will understand this message. Well, all of a sudden, you will stand in certain places and then the Spirit of God will tell you that the message I sent to you yesterday, this is the time to manifest. Because you see, if you have ever wondered, the reason why Saul allowed David to face Goliath, I bet you've never thought about it. You know that when Goliath was, you know, harassing the people, what he said to them was, Get a champion to come and face me. If that your champion defeats me, all of us will become your slave. But if I defeat him, all of you. So for David to allow a teenager to face Goliath, 
Did you know why? It was because what, of what happened to him here. Look at what happened to him. When he heard of the predicament of the men of Jabez, the Bible says immediately the Spirit of God came upon him. And he became angry in the Spirit. And he said, go and tell them. There will be help. So when he saw David in that element, he remembered when it happened to him. He knew that this is another man that God has raised that is going to take away reproach from God's people. When the Spirit of God moves upon you, it may come upon you in a manner of speaking that you just need to say something. You see, many times you think that, you know, you have to carry... You see, what we see in Scripture is that when David went to Goliath, Goliath looked at him and said, what kind of foolishness is this? You came to me with... With what? See, many times... It is we that underestimate the weapons that God has given to us. You underestimate it. Sometimes it's just a word, a counsel. Sometimes God can stir your heart to pray about something. But you say to yourself, who am I? When there's also people, you see, but thank God for David. He did not underestimate what he had. Hallelujah. So in this season, that word keeps coming to us. It keeps coming to us. In Isaiah 54, where the team of this service came from, you know, it says, sing, O ye barren. Sing, when there's no reason to rejoice. You know, that song says that, you know, with our hands lifted high, we will worship and sing. So when the world wonders why, that means that people are looking at you and they're like, there's no reason for you to be singing. But you know that your sun is rising. You know that by the time the sun is hot, there is help. <laughs> you have received the sure word of prophecy from God. That you have not been left without help. That the help of God is constant. The Bible calls him a very present help in time of need. He has sent his word to us people. You know before now. You know, there are all manner of things that we've gone through. You know, Pastor Justin was talking about, you know, understanding the movement on the mulberry trees. Positioning. Understanding. You see, those things. I don't know. You see, when you, when you, when you come to church and you don't take note of those things, you don't understand that God is leading us to something. All of a sudden, then things begin to happen. Things begin to fall into place. And then you remember, that's the reason why I was being prepared in this way. That's the reason why. Now, guys, there's movement on the mulberry trees. And when that happens, there is a way you must position yourself. There is a way you must intercept that which God is doing. Because in this Genesis 18, when God told Abraham that I will return to you, he then said, will I do a thing without revealing it to Abraham? You know where he was going? Sodom. He was going to Sodom to destroy the city. And he was saying to Abraham, I want to give you that privilege so that you can intercede for a city. So that you can intercede, so that you can, you can deliver a nation. While Abraham was still looking for his son, God was already discussing nations with him. There is more in God. There is more. There is more in God. There is more. We have the capacity to, dis to discuss and to intercept the destiny of nations. Why are you still looking at yourself? That is it me that is living in this? Yes, it's you, Abraham. You, so son of Abraham, daughter of Abraham. God is saying to you, I want to have a discussion with you. He said to Abraham, he said, you, see, you see, the way God treated the issue of Isaac, that was an issue to Abraham, it was a by the way. That they had finished eating lunch. He said, hey, so by the way, that issue. And guess what? Abraham had come to a place of rest concerning it. He was not the one troubling him and saying, how about now? He said, so by the way, that issue of um, child, by this time next year, it will happen. So on to the more important things. Nations. Somebody is saying that God is just a job I've been trusting you for. Now, God, do this job. No. 
When the visitation comes, they will tell you that that job has been provided. But by the way, that's a by the way. On to the more important things. Just like we saw in the life of Saul, that he thought that it was all about those asses. But he said, no. There is a higher call in God. There is a higher call. But it takes us to be sensitive. Because, you see, in this season, there is a posture that it requires. Sensitivity. Accurate positioning. You must not be found in, in the wrong place. I'm telling you, sometimes you have that nudging from God. You know, a lot of people now, they are still doing, there's COVID, and they are just relaxing. Some people are watching on YouTube, sleeping and waking up, and all those kind of things. See, that kind of attitude will not cut it. I'm telling you. I'm te it will not cut it. You must understand that when there is movement on the mulberry trees, it's not that time that you now be discussing politics. No. You need to act. You need to take a position. Because when the sun is hot, there is always help. I'd like you to rise on your feet this morning and let's just begin to speak to God. Let's speak to him this morning. Just speak to God this morning. I don't know where you are. I don't know what it is. But I know like I know my name. That God's word has come to somebody this morning. He has come to position. He has come to strengthen. He has come to quicken. When Paul was praying for the Ephesian church, he said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know. He has come. The word of God has come that you may know. This service, God is quickening somebody's heart that you must change posture. That this person is actually your visitation. That is about you. Something is about to shift. Something is about to shift. You're about to break forth on the left and on the right. Open your mouth and speak to God.